Hey there, this video is all about 6K RAW in the Canon R3. I'll be taking a look at things like dynamic range, image quality, noise level, and then whether or not you should be shooting in 6K RAW. So let's first talk about some of the recording options in this camera. If you shoot in 6K RAW, it comes in two different flavors, standard and light. And there's a big difference in terms of the bit rate, which we'll get onto later on in the video. Now that's only available in one aspect ratio of DCI or 17 by nine in 6,000 by 3,164. Now, if you shoot in 4K, there are three different flavors, all I, IPB and IP light, but you can do this in two different aspect ratios. So DCI or 17 by nine, which is 4096 by 2160. That's gonna be a 6K oversample down to 4K and then in UHD or 16 by nine, 3840 by 2160, you get a 5.6K oversample. And the difference between the 6K and the 5.6K is just because of the aspect ratio of 17 by nine or 16 by nine. So in this video, I'll be comparing the 6K raw with the 4K DCI because they'll have the same aspect ratios. Let's talk for a minute about C-Log3 versus raw. Now this camera doesn't shoot in C-Log2, it shoots in C-Log3 when you're shooting in 4K, and Canon RAW is not a true RAW like some other camera manufacturers RAW. Like when you bring in the file into the computer, you can't change things like the ISO, the white balance, etc. But when you bring the Canon RAW files into your editing software, it will interpret them as C-Log2. So as you can see here, this is what shows up in Final Cut when I bring in the raw footage. It shows up as C-Log2, and it'll actually automatically apply the C-Log2 conversion lot, which I did turn off. So keeping in mind that this is just how the camera interprets it. And so you can see here that if you look at the raw image versus the C-Log3 image, the raw image is much flatter and has less contrast, which makes sense because it's interpreting it as C-Log2. There's a lot of misunderstandings about cameras like the R3 and the R5C and that they shoot in C-Log2. They don't shoot in C-Log2, they shoot in raw. And then when you bring it into the computer, it interprets it as C-Log2. But keeping that in mind, that's how we're gonna be using the footage, it's gonna look like C-Log2. So if you take a look here at the graph of the Canon log curves, hopefully you've seen this before, what you can do here is you can sort of use this graph to sort of expect what you what you will see in terms of the results. So if you look in the upper right hand part of the of the graph here, you can see that C log two should perform better than C log and C log three in the highlights. And if you look down the bottom left part of the graph into the shadows, you will see that they're pretty similar. So that's kind of what I expect to see here in terms of the dynamic range. I'll be getting onto the test in one second, but I just wanna make a few comments about dynamic range testing in general. And I have talked about this in a previous video, but a lot of people are just looking for the number of stops of dynamic range and getting it into one value. And that's just only part of the way of evaluating the dynamic range capabilities of a camera. If you're looking for that number, uh, you don't look at the manufacturer's number because it's always gonna be higher than what you get in real life. I would recommend going to Cine D or Gerald Undon. They have fancy tools that they can test these. I don't have those tools. But that, again, that is only part of a way to evaluate the dynamic range of a camera. So the other ways that we're gonna do this, we're gonna do a latitude test or what's known as a push-pull test. And so we're gonna overexpose and underexpose the image to see how far you can push and pull the image and where it breaks and where its strength and weaknesses are in terms of noise and color. And then I'll also do some outdoor real life examples because I don't see a lot of that with dynamic range testing. So we'll do both of those. If you're curious about how I expose and grade C-Log3 both in a studio setting and then outside, I'm not gonna get into that in detail in this video because I made a very detailed video about that, which I'll leave linked down below. It's all about the R5 and the R7, but it'll work perfectly well on the R3 as well. Now for the overexposure test, I kept everything at 24 frames a second, shutter speed at one over 50, and the ice so it was at the base of 800. Now I adjusted the lighting at F16 using a gray card and 35%, which will give me the proper exposure in C-Log3. And then as I am opening up the aperture to let in more light, I will overexpose the image. And so when I bring into the computer, I didn't use any LUTs. I basically added contrast, saturation, and a slight white balance correction. And I graded this all at zero stops. And then as I overexpose the image for each clip, by opening up the aperture, I just adjusted the exposure, but I didn't touch the color at all, so you could get a really good read about what's happening with the color. So take a look at the overexposure test. 
The results from this were pretty much as we expected based on the graph that we looked at earlier. Now, again, because the raw footage is interpreted as C-Log2, we're gonna get more performance in the highlights. Taking a look at the footage here, starting at four stops over, they both look really good with a little bit of lightening of the skin there on C-Log3. When you get to five stops over, the raw footage looks great, whereas the C-Log footage starts to break. The color did hold really well in both situations. Now, I didn't have enough light or a fast enough lens to get more than five stops overexposed, but I'd probably estimate this as one to one and a half stops better in the highlights for the RAW. Now for the overexposure test, and for this, it was pretty much the same, but the other way around. So 24 frames a second, shutter speed at 1 over 50, ISO at the base of 800. I adjusted the lighting at f2.8 to get 35% of my gray card, and then I just closed down the aperture to let in less light. And again, I graded everything at zero stops in post, and then I just adjusted the exposure for each stop of underexposure and didn't touch the color at all. So take a look. My opinion is that C-Log3 and the raw footage were good till about negative two and two and third stops, but they performed very similar. One thing is that I think they is very usable in those lower stops, but you might need to add some noise reduction in post. Now, a couple of things that I think were different and one is very expected. You're gonna get a little bit more noise in RAW than you are to get in C-Log3. If you've ever shot in RAW before, you know that's common, but it wasn't like a lot more. It was just a little bit more. And we'll see this a little bit later with some real life examples. One thing I did notice is that there was a color shift starting at two stops under and even darker, I definitely noticed that the shadows were changing colors. And again, we'll see this in some real life examples. Another thing I just wanna point out was the autofocus started to struggle both in C-Log3 and in RAW at around negative two and two third stops. So let's take those results from the controlled studio test and compare them with real life examples outside. So for these examples, I didn't use the gray card in 35%, like I mentioned before. I used the other method I used for getting proper exposure, which again is in that video linked down below. Basically, I use the histogram and I just expose as high as I can and protect the highlights. So I get them to clipping point and then I just back them down just a little bit and then I just grade it. So take a look at the examples here and then I'll discuss them. Hopefully that was interesting for you. So let's go through some of these examples and I wanna share my thoughts. The first one was with me standing in the shadow with the bright background behind me. Of course, it's best to always light your subject, but all of you know that this happens from time to time and it really does test out the dynamic range of the camera. So what I noticed here was that the raw footage had a little bit more noise in, this, in my sweatshirt in the darker areas and that was kind of expected as we saw with the, um, the indoor test. What I did notice, which backs up again, the indoor test were that the shadows are a slightly different color if you compare the two. But also the big point that I wanna make in this example and also in future examples is the highlight roll off is different. And if you don't know what highlight roll off means, it's kind of how the log curve handles at the, you know, the, the bright spots of the image at the very extreme. And when you have a very smooth highlight roll off, the highlights look much more natural. They look much more smooth. When you see something that has a harsh roll off, they, the, when it gets up to bright white, it just looks harsh and sort of more like a digital mirrorless camera, if that makes sense. So if you take a look again at this image here and you look at the pavement behind me, you can see that the raw, in my opinion, has much better highlight roll off than the 
C-Log3 footage. Now onto the two flower examples. I think they were pretty similar, but the only difference I really noticed, again, the highlights on the leaves and the bokeh look slightly more pleasing in the raw footage, but it was very subtle and the images, in my opinion, looked very, very similar. Now taking a look at this shot with the birdhouse, again, this I think is a clear difference in terms of the highlights, like I mentioned before with the highlight roll off, you can definitely see it on the grass the most, but you can also see it on the tree on the right side of the image and also with the leaves. Now this last shot was a shot of me where I was heavily backlit. I just wanted to show you know how it does in that situation. Again, I think these were pretty similar in this situation. I definitely clipped the highlights just a little bit on the greenhouse and there was slightly more detail, I feel like in my sweatshirt, but it was very close and very, very similar. So I know I've been talking a lot about dynamic range and noise and stuff like that throughout this video, but in terms of image quality, I think they're gonna be very similar if you're exporting in a 4K timeline, because if you're taking 6K raw out of this camera and putting it in a 4K timeline, or the camera is downsampling from 6K to 4K, you're gonna get a very similar image as you saw in those examples. Of course, if you're handing off this footage for people doing, you know, visual effects and stuff like that, of course, having 6K RAW is going to be beneficial for those people. So what are my conclusions on 6K RAW versus C-Log3? Well, I think the controlled studio tests and the outdoor tests definitely back each other up here. If you're shooting in RAW, you'll get a little bit more dynamic range in the highlights and you'll get a more pleasing or softer highlight roll off. You also get just a little bit more detail in the shadows and maybe a little bit more noise comes with that. So you might be thinking, well, I'll just shoot in 6K RAW. Well, there are some downsides, so let's talk about that. First of all, like I mentioned, the noise was only slightly worse in RAW, but I think it's easy enough to fix in post. Uh, I didn't do this in any of these examples here. I didn't apply any noise reduction in post. It is one more step that you have to do, and it can be very taxing on your computer, but I think it would clean up pretty easily because the noise is pretty well controlled. Now, the biggest downside about shooting in 6K RAW are the file sizes. This is one thing that I really struggle with with Canon is that their codecs are just ginormous. So all of these numbers here that I'm sharing are all in 24 frames a second. So if you shoot in 6K RAW, which of course is in DCI, it's 1600 megabits per second. That is a lot. If you shoot in the the 6K raw light, that's 900 megabits per second, which is, again, a lot. We'll compare those in a second. But if you're shooting in the 4K mode, so all I, in either DCI or UHD, it's 470 megabits per second. In IPB, it's 170 megabits per second. In IPB light, it's 85 megabits per second. So the first question you're probably wondering is, what about raw versus raw light? So if you take a look at this example here, I didn't notice a ton of difference between raw and raw light. Now, I didn't do extensive testing. It might have to do with motion or quick moving subjects or things like that in terms of the way it compresses the image. I'm not really sure, but if I was personally going to be shooting raw, I'd probably shoot in raw light because 1600 megabits per second is just insanely large. So I'd probably shoot in raw light or what I usually shoot in is the 4K IPB, which is 170 megabits per second, which is you know totally a manageable file size. And if you're wondering about cards, there's a couple cards I recommend. One is this Angel Bird card, which is extremely affordable. It's $180 for 512 gigabytes. So it works great in cameras like the R3, the R5, and the R5C. And I've been really happy with the ProGrade V90 SD cards. They work in like all my cameras. I'll leave these linked down below if you're interested. All right, so what are my takeaways with all these tests? Well, I think it's pretty clear that RAW has a little bit more dynamic range, especially in the highlights. The noise was very manageable in RAW. I don't think that was much of an issue. The big issue that I have with shooting in RAW is the file sizes are just absolutely ginormous and you really have to plan for that. And I know a lot of people do talk about having memory cards that are large enough, but because of this Angel Bird card, it's really not that much of an issue. But Keep in mind when you bring the, the files into your computer, you have to then store them and they add up really, really quickly. My last thought about this camera and the raw capabilities is that this camera should have C-Log2 in it. I definitely think that the sensor can handle C-Log2. There is enough dynamic range in it and I don't think we'll see it in a firmware update because they only put C-Log2 in their cinema cameras, but not in the R5C. Anyways, some food for thought. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you did, please consider subscribe down below. It'd be greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you in the next one.